Okay, so next up we have an investor panel. Uh, this is for all the investors in the room that want some alpha. Biggest trends in this bull cycle and deep in summer. So let's welcome Sheth, partner at Borderless Capital to the stage, along with Keith Chang, managing partner at SNZ, Cosmo Jang, investor at Pantera, and Gil Rosen, managing partner at Blockchain Builders Fund and Deep in Surf Mentor. Well, it's great to have you guys here today. And I think the name of this panel is excellent. I didn't come up with it, but I'm gonna use it as our first question. So very straightforward. What are the biggest trends you guys are excited about for this bull cycle and specifically for Deep in Summer? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I was at this event last year and uh, thank the IOTEX team for working with everybody. They have the, the kind of consistent collaborative spirit with all the different deep end projects and investors. So really thank you guys for continuing that. Um, <clears throat> so I think the biggest drivers that we see are um, one, the category of, of deep end has emerged for the first time, I believe in this uh, newest cycle as um, one of the top sectors where people are looking for growth and value accrual in the Web3 crypto space. Um, you know, projects that otherwise seem like they were interesting, like Helium, <clears throat> Demo, et cetera, in the last cycle, are now becoming like these much larger projects. And now there are, you know, tons of, of new projects, exciting ones, that are learning from that model and that are showing all kinds of different relevance to different constituencies all over the world and different sectors. I think Deepin is probably the, one of the most differentiated areas within Web3 because you could look at pretty much any sector and potentially come up with a model for potentially uh, introducing Web3 incentives and, and some of the innovation in crypto um, to create real innovation there. So <clears throat> one is that the category has emerged as a main investment uh, area for many different funds and many different uh, analysts. Um, I think the second one, and we can talk about it maybe a little bit later, is we see a, a, a strong differentiation happening between commodity deep in, which we, we consider deep in projects that utilize commonplace devices or ubiquitous devices like phones, laptops, computers that people all have, versus more custom bespoke devices like what HiveMap or Helium and others are creating with these sensors. And we're seeing like a lot of maturization happening on both of those ends, but it's creating very different dynamics. Like commodity deep in is now scaling much faster because people have the devices. They don't have to buy the hardware. But if you want more accurate devices, you want higher value data coming from those devices, then you use these more uh, you know custom built devices. And I think that that's showing more maturity in this sector. And we're really eager to see those different models uh, create a lot of different use cases. So I'll stop there. But um, yeah, happy to hear from the others. Yeah, that, ma that makes a lot of sense. I think um, maybe dovetailing on one of the first points and, and first zooming out a little bit, you know, as, as an investor, we're trying to find, I'm trying to find things that make fundamental sense, have good economics, have good management teams, and ultimately are creating value or creating a service that, that people want to pay for. And I think you know, the, over the arc of time as, as blockchain protocols mature, it's very important that these protocols actually do deliver value and that people do want to pay for those services. And we're starting to see more and more of that start to happen, especially in Deepin. Um, and so that's what I'm most excited about Deepin and why it's become that much more investable, I think, during this bull cycle is really one, we're seeing finally like real evidence of real world businesses bringing real revenue on, on chain. Um, and so they're bringing uh, they're bringing revenue from off-chain or off -chain onto on-chain for the first time, and you're seeing that really accrue to the on-chain ecosystem. Uh, whereas the on-chain ecosystem in the past has always been sort of people taking money out, now there are people putting money in, and that's very exciting. And it's just a proof point that, hey, there actually is value here. These are real businesses. GeoNet has large agricultural companies that pay for services. Uh, like, these are real businesses paying real money for to use blockchain protocols in a special way. So that's what's really exciting. And then... Maybe to a secondary point of that is that, again, as an investor, all I care about is how, how does value accrue to something and where is the value creation? And I think also coming this cycle, we're finally starting to see a lot more protocols, but especially in Deepin, care deeply about 
the fact that their tokens need to have value accrual, that, that, that they need to have a, first of all, they need to have a good uni economic business, but that that uni economics does flow through to token. Um, and so all that makes this a much more investable and real sector to, to, to back. Thank you, and Gil, we got 6 p.m. Red Bull. Let's hear it. Um, so what are, what are we excited about in DPIN specifically? Yeah, so yeah, what, what are the biggest uh, trends that you're looking at for this bull cycle and what are you excited about in DPIN? Okay. So in, in the bull cycle in general, I, I'd say there are things that excite me and there are things that we're investing in. And they're not necessarily the same things. So the things that we're investing in is mostly still like infrastructure, scalability, AI, uh, because ultimately like this, in, this sector makes sense uh, if, you ha if you're yeah, actually able to build things that people want people to use, kind of as, as everyone here has said before. Uh, so, so that's mostly what we're investing in still, because I think we, we still have, I think for the first time, we're actually at a place where we can build viable applications that people would want to use and decentralized applications and, and uh, decentralized physical uh, infrastructure networks that, that are actually viable and low cost and perform it. Uh, but I, I still think we have a ways to go for that. So that, that's what we're investing in. What excites me is actually blockchain being used by real people, right? This is RWAs, this is the regulatory environment that's kind of pushing things forward. Uh, th this is decentralized social, this is DPIN. Uh, like th these are all like, hell's yeah. Awesome. Hello. Yeah, for me, uh, just like uh, jump out a little bit and zoom zoom out a little bit. It's more like uh, uh, actually the most uh, the uh, most important thing for me is like uh, uh, Bitcoin, the ETF uh, finally got passed. I think uh, early this year, uh, but definitely um, I think we don't have to underestimate this kind of like uh, effect because um, w as we've been building the industry for a while, more than ten years, some of those. Uh, Finally, you you know, from time to time, people say, "Hey, this is a scam, right?" When we, when we when we sit in here, there's always people sitting above somewhere that, "Hey, those guys doing some scammy things." But uh, I, I should say, uh, about the tens of years, then we finally this is kind of like a ICC stamped on it. This is a, like a, a alternative asset. You can you guys can you know uh, definitely you know have a relief that you know nobody gonna say that again. So this actually has a a huge impact in uh, either um, uh, traditional finance or like, in crypto. I think this is the most important thing. But in narrative wise, uh, from last year, the inscription, uh, Bitcoin layer two, still like a contradic contradictory, but still I think is uh, leading the narrative, uh, the Bitcoin ecosystem. Uh, later on, I think we can expect uh, 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 Ethereum ETF, uh, hopefully gonna be successfully passed later on. But uh, I think it will be, the same kind of impact um, to uh, deepen specifically. I think we should because everybody now talking deepen, but like uh, two years ago, people were talking about IoT, right? So I think this is kind of like expanding the scope of IoT and uh, de uh, decentralized infrastructure uh, so ne uh, network. But this is more of a broad scope, and you be more inclusive and be more acceptable. So I think this is a big thing in actually in DPIM. Now it's kind of like a common word, but definitely this is not, uh, not easy, I should say. And also this is, uh, I just talked to Alpin and before the, uh, the panel, and this is gonna be like a, a long term, uh, maybe tens of years building in this industry because this is uh, so many opportunities you can always combine uh, token economics or crypto with a lot of uh, traditional business models and create new innovative stuff, yeah. Yeah, so ju just to touch on that, on the ETF, because that's obviously the, the biggest news in the sector right now. So how do you view the capital flows from the ETF? Do you see that going into DPIN? Do you see those the, that capital from the institutional side flowing into DPIN? Or is that gonna come from the bottom up? Or how do you think about that, if at all? Yeah, um, maybe I can pick up that, um, uh, because yeah, this is a really good question. I'm always asking ourselves, right? When the market has been uh, trillions of dollars, then what's the actual money come from? So that's always we have to ask, right? When we have a bull market, we are really bullish. Where are those liquidity comes from? So um, I think in early May, I uh, just talked to about uh, 10 
hedge fund managers in, in, in New York. So some of those guys are uh, really uh, over in daily on their um, fund. Uh, it's a $50 million and up. Uh, so I actually received kind of surprisingly 100% of uh, bullish on the future growth. Uh, but definitely there are something like a, like I said previously, I underestimated uh, the impact of uh, Bitcoin when I do my uh, reflection. But um, the thing is, a lot of those uh, traditional financing uh, fund, hedge fund or financing family office or financing institutions, they have such kind of criteria set up there uh, only if those ETF been passed and maybe a few months later they can buy ETF. Those fund managers, they don't have the incentive uh, you know, in the traditional environment to buy ETF uh, previously or like a just open an account in Coinbase. Actually, you can, you can, but they don't have the incentive to do so. Um, so I think there's still money like a flow in, uh, in, in crypto, but will be uh, first in uh, Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum, if Ethereum uh, ETF passed uh, later on. Um, so I think there's, there's gonna be like the, the faucet uh, then later on, maybe just like they will flow to other um, altcoins and stuff, e depend as well. Yeah. Mean coins too. Gil, you, you want to take this? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I think I, I agree with that. I think there, there's kind of two flows here of capital, though. There's like the trickle down, like, right? So uh, ETF comes in, we have capital inflows that makes uh, crypto investors wealthy and they're looking at what to invest and they have capital to deploy into interesting projects. But then there's kind of to what you were saying. There's an air of legitimacy here that has now been attributed to the entire space overall. Uh, and, and that means that like both institutional players are, are now actually like looking uh, not just at, you know, they might start with a Bitcoin uh, and Ethereum ETF, but then they're also looking at other potential uh, kind of uh, investments that they can make. And Deepin is something that makes sense, right? This is like something in the real world that is creating real value. Uh, and, and they will also start to look at these. So I, I, th I think like uh, the inflows are both like indirect and direct uh, for Deepin specifically. Yeah, just <clears throat> just another thought. I think there's in Deepin there's the network and then there's the token. And I think that you know you have flows of, of capital that will go into assets. And as people see and and learn about Deepin related tokens. Um, you know, there's likely to be an interest, like we're already seeing in some of the, sorry, some of the leading deep end projects, uh, like Render, HNT, et cetera, they're seeing quite a bit of capital activity within the crypto markets. Obviously nothing relative to Bitcoin, but we're seeing it grow. Separately, you have who invests in the expansion of the networks. And I think that's, in, it's kind of not exactly related to that. I think it's more that where are the founders and teams that are working on these projects really engaging with the, the larger market and the larger society, different countries, different industries, to uh, get them to actually set up these networks, knowing that the token incentive is actually gonna make it worth it over time, um, and that there's real value coming out of the networks, whether it's data, whether it's <clears throat> other kinds of information that's being collected from sensors, et cetera, um, or connectivity. And I think we're gonna continue to see more of that, but I think that, like was said, I think the Bitcoin ETF, the ETH ETF, all of that just validates that this industry is actually worth investing in, paying more attention to, and we're going to see more and more fund managers doing that. Yeah, I mean, look, I think I don't think any of the Bitcoin flows are coming to specific sectors of crypto uh, specifically. Like, obviously, there's a flow of funds, but it, it's not that simple. I, w I would say, though, that it's opened the eyes of people to look at crypto again, and so as a result, we have this opportunity as an industry to really show them that, hey, we actually have real protocols that do real things now. That was not true as recently as three or four years ago. And, uh, and so it's really incumbent upon us to do that education. You know, the number one question I get from any LP is, in any of my LP meetings is, hey, like, Bitcoin's cool, but like, where is the value creation? Like, why should I care? Where is their productive use, real use cases? And I always think, to think, I always think of Deepin as the number one like, productive real use case. I talk about guys like GeoNet who are building the largest RTK world network globally, competing against $10 billion public companies, even though they have a larger network. I talk about guys like G uh, GenomesDAO who are uh, you know, effectively creating decentralized 23andMe and 
disrupting how 23 is making these grown. And you can see these things are actually real world businesses that are creating value. And that's that, 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 that education of that there is real value creation is what's going to get capital to sustainably come. Yeah, it, it strikes me that Deepin is one of the rare Web3 cases where you have actual on-chain revenue, which then allows sort of traditional investors to come to a sensible valuation and invest in as a result. So just on that, that topic, because obviously most Deepin projects don't have revenue. So how do you think about investing, right? So what are the key metrics? How do you value uh, a market opportunity? Um, just what are the overall criteria for uh, an investment in a deep-end project, and specifically a pre-public, pre-TGE project? Yeah, I mean, look, I think there's a total misunderstanding of what fundamental value analysis means. Fundamental value analysis does not mean the company has to make money today. What it means is you're buying something for less than it's going to be worth in five years from now or ten years from now, and that's based on the future unique economic potential of this business. So. The only thing I care about is what are the sustainable unit economics of this protocol or of this, uh, of this specific unit of work five, 10 years from now when you've scaled. That's the number one question. We look at how does that compare to real world businesses? How does it compare to cost structures that I know that exist? Um, and, and what things are being arbed out very uniquely by crypto incentives? Uh, and so you know, it doesn't matter at all to me that these, a lot of these things don't make money today because it's all about how much money will they make five or 10 years from now. I guess like when we're thinking about deep in specifically, it's, I, I mean, there are a lot of different types of deep in here, right? You, you've got coordination of people, not, you're Nosh, you're, you're uh, I forget the, the Uber competitor one. Uh, you, you've got uh, underutilized assets, uh, you, you're like GPU marketplaces and your, um, uh, your GPU marketplaces and, uh, and uh, you know, stor storage, file coin, et cetera. And then you have like, net new physical devices, uh, which is your, your Chirp, your Helium, et, et cetera. Uh, I think if you're going to do like a net new physical device, that's just really hard. And you have to have a ton of sector expertise to really know that industry inside out to be able to compete with it. Because ultimately, the fact that it's blockchain or not is kind of like, that's an added value. You have to be able to, to create a, a good product. Talk about like underutilized assets specifically. In our view, you need to have a competitive mode, generally a technical mode. Uh, and like we invested in Exhibits and we, we liked them because they were one of the few GPU marketplaces that actually had like accel hardware acceleration that allowed for them to compete and they weren't just like yet another marketplace because if you don't have that technical mode then people are just going to copy you super fast. Uh, right? So you need to know the sector and you need to have ideally for us some sort of technical mode. Yeah, I mean I think this is probably the most um, relevant question for us at Borderless. We've been investing in Deepin from 2019 um, in the earliest projects, and we are we just announced publicly earlier this year we're launching a hundred million dollar Deepin fund three. Um, so, why invest in this space? Why dedicate so much capital to this particular space? And how do you determine what to invest in? I think, you know, ultimately some of the things that we've seen have basically been validation points all from the beginning of when we started investing, which was obviously Render, Helium were some of the first ones to do this. But what we were seeing was, one, <clears throat> they're able to capture the popular imagination, right? The popular participation all over the world, potentially. I know it's not even everywhere, but the fact that you can launch a network like this and people can go on the internet, they can purchase hardware, or they can just connect their device are able to participate and be part of something like that is very powerful. So I think that they have shown, these two networks in particular, Render and Helium, the potential of scalability and growing something so substantially large in such a small amount of time. The second thing is, are the teams mature enough to really adapt and pivot through different market cycles, through different ups and downs, and do they have enough background in at least some sector to really think through the problem that they're trying to solve? And you know, again and again and again, it's always you know, the fundamentals comes down to the team because they might start in one area or one specific side of the problem, but they're going to have to evolve. And I think we've seen that with many of these. Um, I mean, the third one then comes down to 
I think this longer term question about where's the money going to come from, uh, because it's, it's very you know, relevant to Deepin that they're basically disrupting existing um, industries. One of the most powerful things about Deepin from my perspective is the fact that they're able to scale so quickly, potentially, is that they actually can keep up with the speed of technological innovation for how we distribute infrastructure globally. Infrastructure has typically been the most important factor in growing an economy, and it's usually one of the slowest things to evolve because it takes a lot of money. It you need large actors to, to actually invest early on. Deepin disrupts that whole process, and that's very exciting. At the same time, you're able to do it in a way that's potentially more even or globally distributed. Obviously, we have work to do there, but I think as teams mature, as tokenomics mature, that's what we're excited about. Ever since we started investing, we've continued to see more and more high-quality projects. We get lot of, lots of deal flow in this particular area, and we're seeing teams continually iterate and learn from prior projects. A lot of projects are learning from each other, working from each other, partnering with each other, and I think there's a lot more maturity now than we've ever seen, and it gives us a lot of conviction. Thank you. Yeah, for us, I think uh, it's uh, more general. So um, first is like a still business a business. So uh, what kind of uh, problem you are tackling? So still ask questions. So if you have a really clear defined problem, right? So that's the first one we're gonna ask. Then the next will be how big is the problem? So how much, uh, what is kind of like addressable market, right? That's kind of depend on your ceiling. So if like it's uh, like a, a million dollar market, then probably you don't worth to spend too much of energy on it. But if like it's a, a billion dollar market, then yeah, it may worth something there. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's uh, uh, the, the third one. The fourth one would be how do you guys solve it? So um, in early stage, maybe we cannot see a very clear path, but uh, later on as you, in Deepin is more specific, you have devices, you have adoption number, then you have a tracking record. So if we saw a curve like a, you know, uh, if, if it's straight linear, it's fine, but also if you have like a, those uh, parabolic curve and uh, exponential growth, then that will be, you know, adoption will be uh, some of those, you will see definitely the patterns from the Helium and other uh, demos, some of the other um, uh, successful companies, we will see that kind of pattern. I think it's, uh, not a hundred percent for everything else, but definitely will be a good reference or benchmark. So I think in general, it's uh, uh, deep in still following the uh, similar like uh, logic we are doing investment decisions, but it has its own uh, specific uh, things. Yeah. Thank you for your answer. So, so deep in is is a little bit hard to pin down. It's a broad category. It's hard to define. We've come up with some models for thinking about it. Gil shared. Uh, one of those, but uh, I just want to ask you guys to share the subcategories that you guys are most excited about, right? And, and in particular, right, you guys have all deployed capital in Deepin, uh, some of the portfolio companies that you're most excited about in those subsectors. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think all of us could probably speak a lot about this because that's what's uh, super exciting. I mean, I'll just start quickly on two different categories. One is infrastructure. We're investors in IOTEX, we're investors, we just led the round for Peak or co-led it. Um, we're seeing a lot of interesting innovation happening on the infrastructure side and those things we think will benefit multiple projects, not just one pr project or one particular application. And so that's an area that we continue to look at. Um, tooling, different kinds of uh, protocols that will grow the longer term value of these deep end projects, uh, retention, uptime rates, things like that. Um, and then, of course, there's the applications. Like a great example for, for us, obviously, is GeoNet, um, where we, we led the, the pre-seed. And what we saw there was someone from the industry that saw the problem and took it on with you know, a lot of precision, a lot of maturity. You know, now it's the largest uh, network in the world. What's, what's great to see is that um, these projects now are you know, delivering real data that, that's being used uh, by industries all over the world. A couple of the other examples are Natix. Um, <clears throat> they're providing real-time uh, information on what's happening on the streets. And like I mentioned earlier, 
we're investors in, in several projects in the space and the mapping and the kind of uh, visualization space. You know, Hive Mapper has a different approach, which we're, you know, we're also very excited about. But Natix is growing tremendously because it's utilizing what we call these commodity dependent devices or mobile phones that are already available. And um, yeah, it's great to see basically people taking on a challenge, which in this case is having fresh information about what's happening on the roads is extremely valuable. And the more and more you're able to refresh that, um, the more valuable your network will be. And so making it possible for people to use their phones to track all that kind of information, I think is very powerful. Um, so there's just a couple of examples that we're super excited about. Yeah, I, I don't really think of Deepin as categories, and it sounds like there, there's probably a lot of crossover on the stage of what we're invested in, and so I'll, I'll be brief. But I think the number one thing that I screen for is how does this unique economics get improved by putting it on blockchain? All that matters to me is that there's some sort of price arbitrage, and one of the most common types of, or sorry, cost arbitrage, one of the most common types of cost arbitrage is labor arbitrage, and so we're seeing that with GeoNet with farmers being the ones putting up their own RTK substations because they don't need to go out of their way to do it on their own farm. We see it in the case of HiveMapper where Uber drivers are passively you know, mapping data around them. They don't have to go out of their way to map like Google Maps does. And so it's really that cost arbitrage that enables these businesses to be more interesting and better solutions. Um, so, so that's where we're looking. Yeah, I think we're, we're similar in that sense. Kind of a, again, I, I'm excited by kind of net new hardware devices that, that can do X, Y, Z. Uh, but I, I just think those are generally hard businesses. It's hard to pivot, it's hard to iterate, you have uh, high capital expenses. Whereas passive devices for data collection and leveraging kind of blockchain incentives to coordinate people to collect data, I, th I think uh, it is a, it's a low hanging fruit uh, that is now kind of being supercharged by uh, Gen AI, right? Uh, the, the fact that you can now like, uh, the, the value of data is worth that much more because you can now leverage it for kind of the, the, you know optimizing these models for creating rag data sets that can be used for uh, any number of different use cases. So I, I think like I, again like Demo, like Hive Mapper, etc. Uh, the, the ability to kind of passively leverage blockchain incentives to passively uh, passively collect data and then leverage. Uh, AI models to, to make sense and actually create net new value of that data is something that for us is like, it's an inflection point that, that makes this data collection all the more valuable. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I just echo to um, uh, what uh, Alpin just said. Um, definitely infrastructure for uh, Deepin is just a very early stage, I should say. Uh, for example, the uh, uh, Definitely at the end of the day, we're going to issue some assets. So how those assets will be traded or how the price discovery mechanism will be uh, taking place. I should say the liquidity and all those uh, place for uh, dedicate, possibly dedicated place for uh, trading uh, those um, uh, deep end assets will be of very really interesting. Um, because currently I don't think uh, as a whole uh, category, or assets category in deep end, uh, we still lack of uh, those kind of uh, infrastructure. And uh, uh, the other thing is uh, the data, we mentioned data, right? The data being processed uh, in the uh, uh, deep end kind of like a, a processing um, a route. So there's still some gap, right? Uh, I think Autax is doing something there uh, to uh, give, like uh, generate those proofs uh, or like a, 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 a TE environment to process those data, then uh, this is kind of like um, uh, bridging the gap. Uh, so uh, you know, data be uh, has more transparency, and all the algorithms are uh, transparent. So that's also very important. Um, definitely, there are more things we can do in infrastructure. Um, the other thing, like, uh, really excites me is, uh, like I said, the the deep end is actually so inclusive. Uh, the scope expanded so much, you can put a data inside, you can put a GPU, like computation power previously, not com considered as IoT, it's more heavy assets, right? Uh, so that will be s included in, now included in uh, deep end. So uh, that part I think is, uh, you generally can c include every infrastructure into deep end. Uh, so that's actually excites me. Well, thank you so much for your time.